let's have a look at these examples for slides three through five. So this is where we are going over the basic if statement. Okay, so we're gonna start off with a simple one, number two here. And on this one, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have MATLAB generate a random integer using the randi function. The range of that integer should be negative five to five. Then we're gonna use an if block to figure out if that number is greater than one. If it happens to be greater than one, we're gonna print out a message that says the number is greater than one. Okay, so really simple, but it, it kind of shows you what the if function is doing. So first let's generate our random number. So I'm gonna say number equals randi. Then remember in parentheses, you put the range in brackets. So we'll have negative five to five. And let's leave the semicolon off so we can see the number. Now let's do our if statement. So what we wanna do is we wanna check and see if the number is greater than one. So we're gonna say if number greater than one. So if that's true, we wanna display this statement. So number is greater than one. And then we end, okay? So this statement here only gets displayed if this right here is true, okay? So if number is, you know, turns out to be negative four, this would be a false statement. This is not going to get displayed. So it'll only get displayed if number is greater than four, okay? So let's run it and see if it works. All right, so we gotta go to the command window. So our number that was generated is three. That's obviously greater than one. So that was a true statement. So it displays number is greater than one. Okay. So you could keep running this in uh, wrong window and seeing what you get. Okay. You could run it again. Maybe we'll get something different this time. Now we got four, so that's still greater than one. And let's see what we get. All right, so this time we got number equals four. Okay, so that is not greater than one. So that ended up being a false when it did the test. So it did not display that statement because if it gets a false right here, it's gonna immediately jump down to this end line. So it'll skip over whatever you have in between this first line and this end statement. Okay, so let's go to number three. On number three, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a temperature conversion script. It's gonna convert over from whatever temperature you put in over to Kelvins. So our script is gonna ask the user to input a number for the temperature they wanna convert. And then they also need to input the scale that that temperature is in. So are they inputting a temperature in Fahrenheit or Celsius? Now, since they are telling us Fahrenheit or Celsius, that would indicate that's probably gonna be a letter that they will be typing in. So we gotta keep that in mind when we make up our input statement. All right, so first I'm gonna switch to format long G. You don't really have to do that. That's just the format I typically like. Then I'm gonna put temp equals input, and then now enter the prompt. So enter. Enter a temperature, you gotta spell temperature right, in Fahrenheit or Celsius. Okay, so there is the prompt for the numeric temperature. And then after that, we need to know the scale. So I'm gonna call that scale. So next let's go ahead and get our scale. I'm just gonna call it variable scale and then put your little prompt. So enter the temperature scale. All right, and you always usually wanna give a example of what they can put in, so their options. So I'm gonna put F or C indicating that they should enter an F or a C. That is usually helpful to the user, so they aren't left wondering what they need to put in. Now, if they're gonna put in an F or a C, that is a string, okay? So it's like text, so we need to indicate that. So we're gonna put the S in quotes at the end. Okay. 
All right, now we have our temperature number and then we have the scale. Now we need to set up our if statements. So let's do the Celsius first. So if they entered a temperature in Celsius, we need to take that temperature and add 273.15. All right, so this right here would be our conversion equation. And then we will use F print F to display. Okay, so let's do if scale equal to C. Now C, remember, is a string, so it's got to be in these quotes. Okay. And then we'll put temp underscore Kelvin equals temp plus 273.15. Okay. Now let's do a printf to display that result. So I'm just going to put temp in Kelvin's. And then equals percent dot two f, and I would put slash n to move that cursor down, and then quote. The variable that goes in there is temp underscore kelvin. Okay, so that's the end of that if statement. So we put n. Now we do the same thing for Fahrenheit. So if scale is equal to f, oh, no parentheses. Now our conversion that I'm going to do, I'm going to add. I'm going to go to Rankin first and then to Kelvin. So I'm going to do the temperature plus 459.67 and then divide that by 1.8. Okay, then we'll use F print F to display our result. Okay, so for Rankin, we're going to have temp plus the 459.67. And then following that, we'll convert over to Kelvin. All right, so Kelvin is going to be that Rankin temperature divided by 1.8. Okay. And then finally, let's do F print F. So now we'll just say temp in Kelvin's is equal percent dot 2F. Okay. Again, slash N, close that quote, comma, and then the variable you need is temp underscore Kelvin. Close the parentheses and we're done with that, so hit end. All right, so let's run this, see if it works. So here's our prompt to enter a temperature in Celsius. So I'll just do 100 or Fahrenheit. Hmm, I've got a typo here. So we run that and then it wants the temperature scale. Okay, so I'm just going to put C. So now when you hit enter, notice what it does. It takes that temperature, which was 100, added 273.15, okay? And that is exactly what we told it to do right here, okay? So it went through this block because it checked the value of scale and it was capital C. So this is a true statement. So it went ahead and performed these tasks right here, okay? So now let's run it again. We'll put in Fahrenheit this time. So let's just do 100 and then we'll do Fahrenheit. So put in capital F. And obviously I have a typo here, right here. We need to put an N here. There we go. Let's run it again so we don't get that error. So do 100 and then capital F. Now we don't have an error. So now if you do 100 Fahrenheit, then what you get in Kelvins is 310.93, okay? So what happened is it found that capital F, right? Scale was equal to capital F. So this is true. So it's gonna go ahead and do these three lines of code, okay? So when it hit this first if statement, it checked to see if scale was equal to C. It obviously wasn't equal to C. So it immediately jumped down to this N and then proceeded on down to the next line of code. Okay. Now one more thing I want to show you. Let's enter a hundred again. And this time let's enter a lowercase f. Okay, so it didn't do anything that time. And the reason for that is because we only had capital F in here. Okay, that was our only option. We didn't allow for a lowercase f because remember MATLAB is case sensitive. So capital F, lowercase f, two different things. So the way that you have to get around that is to enter one of those OR statements. 
So that's the bar. So you just put or scale equal equal lowercase f. So now it will allow for either of these letters, right? Capital F or lowercase f. So if we run it again, we're going to get 100. And let's put lowercase f. And now it gives us our temperature again. OK? So that's how that works. And coming up in another video, we will figure out how to simplify this a little bit. All right, next thing, number four. Number four is going to use the quadratic equation, right? Everybody's favorite. So we're going to check to see if a quadratic function has repeated roots. So repeated roots are where you would have a root at the same location. And remember, a root is basically where your function crosses the x-axis. Okay. Now, if we have this expression, the ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, those repeated roots are going to occur if b squared minus 4ac equals 0. Okay. So essentially, if you think back to the quadratic equation, this is the formula that's underneath that square root. Okay. And obviously, we don't want to divide by 0. Okay. Because the quadratic equation has z a in the denominator. Now what we're going to do, we're going to have the user input values for a, b, and c. And then we're going to display a message if the roots are not repeated. Okay? And it'll also display a message if they are repeated. And if they are repeated, it gives us the value. Okay? So we need three input statements. So let's just put enter coefficient a, like that. And then same thing for b and c. We'll just Add those prompts. And then finally, one more. Let's put an extra D in here. Let's keep it the same. And I spelled it wrong. There we go. Now it's the same. So this will give us a, b, and c from the user. Now I'm going to go ahead and put this variable repeated. I'll explain what it is in just a second. So just type it out and hold on to it. We'll come back to it. Now we're to our if statement. Okay. So we got to look at our conditions we're looking for. For repeated roots, we've got to have b squared minus 4ac equal to 0 and a cannot be equal to 0. Okay. So I need to include both of those in this if statement. All right, so let's go ahead and say if b squared minus 4 times a times c is equal to 0 and, which is the ampersand, a is not equal to 0. Remember, the not is the little tilde symbol. So that's found on my keyboard under the escape key. All right. So in order to get to the next line of code, both of these statements have to be true. If either one of these is false, it will not go to this next line. It will immediately go to our end statement. All right. So if both those are true, we want to calculate that repeated root. So we're going to say x equals negative b divided by 2 times a. And then let's do our repeated root printout. So let's use f print f, and we'll just say the repeated root is, and I'm going to put percent dot for f. And then close that quote, comma, and then put the variable x. And then next, let's do repeated equals 1. And I'll tell you why that is in just a second. And then end. So this will take care of the case if we have repeated roots. Now, on the next block, this is going to take care of the case when roots are not repeated. All right, so if either of these are false, we don't have repeated roots. So if that's the case, I need to have a if statement that will print out the message that says roots are not repeated. 
Okay, and this is where this repeated variable is going to come in. All right, so for this if block, we're going to say if repeated is equal to zero, then display roots are not repeated. Okay, and then we end. Now let's think about what that's doing. So I created this variable repeated. It's going to kind of be used as a flag. And repeated is going to stay equal to zero unless I come in here because I have a repeated root. All right, so then if I have a repeated root, I'm going to set repeated equal to one. All right, so the only way repeated can change values from zero is if we have a repeated root. Okay, now we only want to display this statement here that roots are not repeated if we do not have repeated roots. So essentially we're wanting repeated to never change values and always stay at that initial value of zero. Okay, so if repeated has never changed values and is still equal to zero when we get to here, that means roots are not repeated. Okay, so that's what that repeated flag is doing. It's just being used to tell us whether or not we already calculated repeated roots or not. All right. So hopefully that makes sense and hopefully you kind of understand what if statements are doing now. And we will add on to this in the next section. I will see you guys then.